Awesome. And then we had uh, lots of interested people, so they'll filter in here just over the next minute or two. Uh, awesome. So we'll just give them a minute. Things going well? So you've been busy. You've had a ton of different like town halls and events and things. I've been following some of your spaces. You, you've yeah, it's been, been a crazy month. Uh, traveling a lot and also Zen Academy, we're doing a lot. So yeah, over the, I basically got burnt out at the end of last week and I just needed to take time off. So that last weekend, I just largely disconnected and, and watched some Netflix and just vegged <laughs> out. And now I'm back and ready to go again. Good for you. Any guilty pleasures? What are you watching on Netflix? Or is it garbage uh, watching, you don't want to admit? It's a mix, but we're watching, uh, there's this show Manifest that we binged huh. uh, a few months ago and then they just recently came back with the last season. So we're just watching that at the moment. Oh, good. I, I'm i not going to lie, like just be, you know, works heavy when you're stressed. Like it's, it's very difficult for me to watch things that are too thriller or, you know, stressful. So like I remember back in my like finance days, I could not watch Breaking Bad during the week. Uh -huh. just I yeah, that's fair. Week. You know, like that kind of tone. So I end up watching really stupid, stupid TV. But um, anyways, well, let's get started. I know we we had, I think, about 100 um, planning to attend to this. So I know they'll filter in over the next couple of minutes. So um, just for opening, I, I mean, Zeneca doesn't need as much of an introduction, but I'll do it anyways. Um, one of the, he's the founder behind 333 Club and Zen Academy, um, a real thought leader in voice for this space. I've always had a ton of respect for him. And as soon as we mentioned Zeneca's name, I think it's echoed throughout at least our community. I think you've been an integral part, Zen, to a lot of people's onboarding process as far as finding a kind of trusted voice to, to, to listen to and inspire to, just to, you know, kind of guide them through and navigate this space. So i um, really excited to have you part of this Our Planet journey and just this whole week around learn good shit really came out of, you know, some of the conversations you and I were having around there's just so many misconceptions of what to do and how to do it in this space and it's so new and it's so nascent and you have, you know, a lot of people that are quote unquote experts but you know, and I think we just wanted to give our community tools, the knowledge, the resources, the, you know, the access to the people that have been doing this for a while, are transparent with their incentives and their intentions, and just, you know, really trying to propel people to become a better investor, um, you know, quite honestly, a more knowledgeable investor versus it's really easy to fall into some hype traps, rat race traps, trying to cover losses, you know, like just all of the things that most of us have fallen for and done and made some of those mistakes. And so this week is all about learning good shit from those that have knowledge to share. Um, so thank you so much for being part of our day two. I'm excited to have you. Zen has been, um, uh, he's here to talk about a number of things. So in our event chat below under experience, if you have any questions, uh, he and I will, will will keep revisiting that final sites. If you can keep an eye on that, we'll just make sure that we're covering questions that people ask. If you want to come on stage, you can, but uh, I totally understand a lot of people are inaudible um, and nonverbal or just, you know, would rather just type it. So not a problem. But yeah, we'll keep this kind of free flowing and hit a number of things. We do have a PO app for this event in all events. I will be sharing the password to that later um, in this session. And so uh, make sure, please, that you have the PO app app. Uh, you have to have that down as a first step and then I'll be sharing the secret key phrase. So um, maybe with that, I mean, Zen, I got, like I'm sure everybody already knows you, but even for just 20, 30 seconds, tell us a little bit you know, more about your, yourself, track record in the space, what you've kind of been up to, and then I'll launch into a, a couple of questions. Yeah, for sure. So I, before crypto and NFTs, I was a professional poker player, which I did for about 16, 17 years, and then really found this space early 2021, mostly, and uh, heard of NFTs, heard of DeFi. Like I, I had heard about crypto and dabbled a bit in 2017, but it wasn't until the start of last year that I really sunk my teeth in and, and fell down the rabbit hole and saw everything that was happening and spent a while trading and flipping and then started creating some content, uh, newsletter and podcasts and other things that... I really enjoyed doing way more and then just decided to lean all in into content and education and then launched Zen Academy about a year ago, which is a community really focused on education, onboarding, um, but also, you know, for more, more advanced stuff as well, teaching people uh, how to trade a little bit and look, we're not an alpha group, but it's like teach people how to fish, you know, don't give them a fish, that kind of thing. So yeah, that's been like the lifeblood of my work over the last uh, year, 
primarily and I do some uh, advising, consulting and like speaking events at, at conferences and stuff as well. Uh, Amazing. And I mean, can you talk to us and elaborate just on the, the importance of educating yourself? It sounds so dry. Like even when I was writing this program, I'm like, oh man, I hope our holders don't think I'm just giving them homework, um, huh. you know, and research and lengthy reports because not everything is digestible. But you know, in our past conversations and a lot of what I think you put out there in your spaces and in your content is find the means, you know, of digestible information for yourself, but just how important it is to educate yourself, especially when you're, you're spending time and money and resources behind some of these things. I'd love you to elaborate on that. Yeah. I mean, education is, I think key to everything, but like you said, it's not exactly the most riveting uh, topic for many people. For some people it is, but I think it's about, I mean, this whole space, we're all learning. That's the thing. Like all of us are still trying to figure out how to navigate the space. And every day there's new stuff coming up, you know, lately it's trying to figure out the whole royalties minefield and situation and path forward. And we're all learning new things about how smart contracts work and what's possible and what's not. And people are trying to innovate and come up with new ideas. And, uh, so I think that education doesn't have to be dry and, and it's actually really, really fun <laughs> in NFTs. That's the best part is like, when you talk about educating, it's a lot of the time it's just like vibing in discord and, and following people on Twitter and hanging out in Twitter spaces and learning that way. And, uh, yeah, it, it can be really fun and I, I find it fun. So hopefully others do too. Uh, and we, we actually, we had Alpha Traders Country Club on, on Monday. Oh my God. Already yesterday. I'm losing hmm. track of my days. You know, and one of the things that they were bringing up that I think a lot of people were chatting about afterwards was intentions, intentions behind why you're buying, looking at the intentions, even behind the project founders and just trying to kind of read through like, why does this exist? And then why do I want it? And, you know, one of the first things that we're touching on is if you buy because you love the art, love the art, you know, and then don't, you're not necessarily stressing about milestones, business plans, what are they doing with the floor price? You, just because your intention was mm. slightly different. Um, and so, yeah, kind of a two, two parter there, one for just your own personal ethos as to why you're in NFTs in the first place and what you're looking for behind, you know, before you make that purchase and make that transaction. And then two, looking at intentions behind the founders. Um, uh, why don't we start with maybe just like the personal intentions? Yeah, I think it's, that's a really great point that they mentioned today. And I think is uh, something I think about and talk about a lot as well. And it's really having a good purpose, intention, reason, why, why you're doing things. And everyone's going to have a different reason and purpose for me. And, and, and people can have different purposes for different things as well. So like sometimes I buy uh, to collect because it's an art piece that I really, really like, or from an artist that I like. And uh, I just want to hold that and, and have that in my collection. Other times it's purely because I think I'm going to potentially be able to make money off of it. And it's like a flip and it's more of a financial investment and I'm buying it now to, to sell into the future. Sometimes it's to be part of a community. If I think it's a community I want to be part of or to partake in some utility. And I think the important part is, so you can do all of that at once, but the important part is to actually have that, uh, take the time to really think through why you're buying a certain thing and have that level of um, consciousness about it. Because I think, most people, most of the time are making decisions without really thinking it through and, and basing it on whether it's FOMO or just, you know, surface level ideas. And it's really worth taking the time to dig deeper, I think. Yeah, agreed. And, and I mean, this is probably harder. You can't read into anybody's mind, but I mean, you, you buy and collect a lot of NFTs and look at some different projects. Is there any kind of like advice or guidance when you're just looking at the intentions behind the group? You know, why are they even here? Why are they launching a project? Why do they need to exist? Um, you know, are there any kind of tall tale signs or things that you can kind of tell or read, you know, on uh, at least like the founding team and what to look for? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's it's as important as it is for like a, buy, a collector or an investor or trader to buy or why they're buying. Uh, it's even more important for a founder or a team or anyone who's launching a project to have for them to have a clear understanding of it. And also for anyone that wants to you know, buy into that project to also be able to have an understanding of it. So th there's infinite reasons why someone might want to launch a project. It could be, uh, <clears throat> could be simply to create a community. It could be to sell and share their art with more people. It could be to have a close relationship with their collectors. It could be to fundraise for some 
uh, you know, IP play. They want to be the next Disney. It could be because they're trying to provide a service or an app. It could be um, charity and impact driven. It could be, you know, to incubate other projects. There's like a million reasons. And I think the most important part is having clarity and having an understanding of the reason. Honestly, for some people, it's, it's literally just to make money as well. And that's, if that's what they want to do, then that's good and great. And that they have the prerogative to do that. Uh, but obviously, if on the flip side, you're thinking about buying into a project and you identify that the only reason they're launching it is because they want to make money. Well, that's probably not a good project to be buying into. So uh, when I, whenever I'm sort of evaluating projects, I like to try and find that reason out. And either it's hopefully you, know, you can find out by having it written on their web page or their Git book or white paper or wherever it is, uh, or simply even asking the team, like if you can hop on a Twitter space and ask the founders a question or hop into the Discord and ask them a question. Uh, that's one of the greatest things about Web3 is how accessible everyone is and, and how it just sort of makes the world a lot smaller. So uh, yeah, just having a good understanding of the why is, is, is awesome and, and really important, I think. Yeah, I, I really like that. And I, I like what you're saying and elaborating on um just the intentions behind anything um, and why am I going into it? And it is so hard. I, I fully have done this where something just popped up on my screen day. It's number one on OpenSea or I'm in some sort of an alpha group and they're making a call. Like this is what you have to go buy. And you're just, you're seeing momentum. Um, all of a sudden behind something, you've done very little work. You're jumping on it. And uh, uh, you know, the one thing I'd love to start getting out there, I know you've spoken about this, not, not in a finger wagging way, but transparency way um you know when it comes to shillers and influencers and people that are incented you know to promote projects in a certain way um i it was one of my favorite posts i think that you did was just levels of disclosure i just said well hold on let me explain why i'm affiliated with this project what i get out of it and i think it's just it's a necessary step i think for this space that you know you're we're putting some people in the limelight they have a platform they have something but you know when it's uh, counterproductive to the progress they're encouraging people to buy because they're heavily incentive to do so. Um, I think that creates some problems, right? Because it's a lack of trust. Trust starts to erode. And so, yeah, we just love you to elaborate on just kind of the call to actions. I think that you were pushing forth a couple of months ago, just on disclosure, transparency about some of these things. Yeah, for sure. I, th I think it's a lot, a lot of it comes down to two, two things. One is that the whole point of crypto and blockchains is to be transparent and have public, you know, a public ledger. That's what a blockchain is. And uh, on-chain transactions are obviously very transparent, but then we're building all this stuff on top. And I think sometimes that transparency gets lost in translation and uh, it, it makes sense. In some cases you, you want to have trade secrets and you want to not necessarily share absolutely every facet of it. And, and if you want to be private and confidential, then more power to you. But I think when it comes to projects or uh for lack of a better term influencers anyone that has like a large following and is publicly talking about the um anything uh the second point is that the space is so small and new and nascent that uh, a single tweet or a thread or a, a video or whatever can really impact the price of a, uh, a token a collection whether it's fungible or not this is getting better over time as the space grows and matures, like a single person doesn't have as much power as they used to, but it is still quite significant. And, and simply like people might buy into a project because a certain person endorses it or tells them to buy it, even though they, they shouldn't necessarily do that. And so when you're in that position and, and you realize that, you know, the things you say might affect the price, uh, if you have any sort of vested interest in the project, maybe you own a bunch of the NFTs or maybe you're trying to sell a bunch or maybe you're part of the team or you're, you're invested or you're getting a percentage of the sales or percentage of the secondary royalties. Uh, people deserve to know that. And I think that, you know, or if you're being paid explicitly to sort of tweet about something or retweet something or, you know, anything like that, I think people deserve to know. And, uh, you know, then there's nothing wrong with that. Like it, there's absolutely nothing wrong with paid promotions and sponsorships and advertising. It's very common in, in the world and it's very, it's a normal thing, but uh, you know there are laws to regulate people, making sure that they disclose their involvement in uh, the regular world and, and outside of crypto. And while it's it's not really enforced in crypto, uh, you know those same laws, but those laws are created because of ethical reasons and uh, and, and and for morality reasons. And I think that uh, people should, I would hope so, try and adhere to them. I know it's not the case, but 
I try to adhere to them at least. It's, it's about what, what lets you sleep at night. And I, I just, I don't like the idea of anyone sort of following me and reading something I say or buying into a project because they think that I uh, endorse it or am, am more a part of it uh, than I actually am. Or if they do, then they should know that I'm also getting paid for it and, and how that situation is evolving. And, you know, they can then take all of the information to make, you know, an educated and informed decision. But, uh, you know, it, it's not right, in my opinion, to have people making decisions based on incomplete information, especially if uh, you might be benefiting from those decisions. Yeah, uh, wholeheartedly agree. Um, question for you, that just kind of even navigating the space as a trader, so kind of wearing that, that hat a little bit more. Do you have any advice, guidance, thoughts on just navigating buying and holding versus selling you know, strategies. I think it's always the hardest thing to time and things are always in hindsight. I've made some calls where I've locked in a two or a three X felt great. And then the damn thing went to nine, uh, mm. you know, just things like that. We, we all have those, you know, stories like, Oh, if I just hold on, or you end up diamond handing and writing it back down to show loyalty. So it's just, you know, it's always hard, uh, in hindsight to try and time things, these things, if all you are looking for is, you know, some sort of an investment gain cap gain. Uh, but yeah, just how are you, how do you kind of think about navigating this? When do you feel good and strong to lock in, you know, again, if that was your intention? Um, and when do you feel like selling or at least, you know, um, buying two or three, averaging down your cost base? It just, I, I'm using a lot of financial terminology, but yeah, just any kind of thoughts on just how you actually navigate your trading strategy? Yeah, it's, it's inevitable, like it's it's inevitable that you will have those situations where you sell too early or you hold too long and you wish you would have changed things in the past. And that's just, that's just a fact of the market. And I think the sooner people can realize and understand and accept that, the easier, slightly easier it gets to sort of handle and manage. And when it comes to my personal strategy, it's usually I'll buy multiples of a thing, even very early on I identified like when my bankroll was a lot smaller than it was now and I didn't have a lot of money I would prefer to you know if it was between buying something for 0.2 ETH or buying another collection where I could buy four of them at 0.05 uh, I would almost always opt for the the latter all things being equal because that gives you the, the fact that NFTs are sort of like all or nothing where you either sell it or you don't having just one in a collection is agonizing it's one of the worst positions to be in from a financial perspective. Now, of course, if you have zero intentions of selling and you're just happy to be part, that's great. It doesn't, it, it's less relevant, but if you are trying to sort of make a financial gain, uh, it, it's very difficult to, to time the top or you know, time the bottom or anything like that. And so by having multiples from a collection, it allows you to average uh, your exit points. And so the term uh, for that is laddering. So let's say you buy something at 0.05 and then it starts going up in price. Well, then maybe you list one at 0 0.15, you list another at 0 0.5, you list another at 1.2 ETH and you hold one. And that way, as it goes up, you you know, you know have these certain points where you, you know, maybe the floor gets swept up and you sell, and then uh, you, know, you start to cover your costs and maybe make some profit. And then you know, if after 0 0.5, it goes, so you've sold there, you made some profit, and then it goes all the way down to zero. Like something comes out, the team runs, whatever it is. Uh, at least you've made a bit of profit and locked up something uh, and you're not holding everything. And yes, maybe, it, of course, it would have been better to sell all of them at the top, but realizing that that's just impossible to time, it sort of averages it, averages it out in a much nicer way if you have multiples of a collection. And, uh, you know, if it then continues to go up and up and up, you've at least held on to one or two that, you know, can capture that upsize. And then as you grow in your bankroll and your trading strategy, maybe instead of minting two to four, you mint five to 10, 20 to 30, and then you can just ladder and average it out a little bit better. Uh, yeah. No, I like that. And how do you manage, how did you learn to manage your own expectations on what going up looks like? Like I think for a lot of us, whether you, you know, you, you spend time, you spend, you know, a lot of your energy researching a project, getting excited about it. You've made that call. And then again, not, not here to do any other kind of call outs, but then you see something like art goblins or just something that just skyrockets right off. It can be, at least even for me, sometimes just demoralize it. Just if you miss the boat on one that just really shoots, you feel like it's hard to align expectations going forward on how most 
projects, you know, can operate or how to then, you know, really understand the fundamentals behind a project, a business and a sustainable business model, all of those things. How have you kind of worked on yourself to kind of regulate what you think is a bet, you know, truly that you might have, um, you know, something that is going to the moon, but those are just so far and few between, right? And so, yeah, would just love any thoughts on just how do you think about what your gains should look like over time and what does going up in success feel like to you? Yeah, it's really, it's difficult and sort of non-tangible for the most part. I've, my history as a poker player really helped uh, sort of put together this unconscious or subconscious rather uh, mindset to like managing risk and managing a bankroll and managing uh, profits and all that kind of stuff where I was comfortable taking greater risks last year during the bull market and when things were going well and you know I would I was okay holding things even though they'd gone up 10x 20x 50x uh, obviously in hindsight I probably should have sold more but you know, it's hard to get to the, even the, the, to get something at 20 X, you have to sort of not sell when at three X's. And part of that is possible because, you know, if you can buy multiple, you, you sell one there and hold the rest a bit more. But the other is just, you know, being able to tolerate increased risks and, and with increased risks come increased rewards. And, you know, it's, it's, it's about just your overall strategy. And, and I knew that I can sort of, I'd been through enough, up and down swings as 16 years as a poker player that I knew that I'd be okay if, you know, everything went to zero. And I was like, oh, that was, you know, I should have gone back. But for some people, they sort of have to take profits and uh, it's it's smart to take profits. But I also, um, yeah, it, it, it's about balancing risk. And so, and my strategy has sort of changed and evolved as time has gone on as well, because last year with a much smaller bankroll, I was flipping a lot more aggressively in short term. And then as time went on, I started, collecting a little more just to collect and then a little more for like holding for long for the longer term and now I have things that I'm happy to hold for five ten years whereas last year I'd be like oh it's like it's gone up 5x I'm going to sell this and then go buy something else and then flip 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 as time went on my strategy changed from flipping very very quickly to sort of holding and buying multiples and so it's, it's an evolving process and it, it continues to evolve to this day. Yeah, that's really smart for for anyone. Just even portfolio allocation matters. I think it's it, whether you trade in the physical world too with stocks, um, ETFs, mutual funds. I think just anyone would always advise you, just depending on your stage of life, right? Whether you're young and you have mm -hmm. a lot of potential earnings left versus you know, if you're old like me. I'm, I'm not that old. I'm in my late thirties, but. Um, just your life stages change, right? And when you have disposable income, and I, I love what you said on some bets, you have to be prepared to zero. And I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of people, um, I remember we used to have these questionnaires on just risk tolerance. And it's so funny because you think you have a risk tolerance up to, you know, 50% variability or something like that until you see it, right? And then it just, you feel that pressure on like, okay, was I okay for this to actually go down <laughs> to half of its initial value because I believe in something in the long term. It just, it really stresses that upon you. And I think for, for people still entering the space on which NFTs do I buy? How do I kind of round out a collection? It's whether you're playing with $100, $1,000, $10,000, you know, depending on your stage of life. I, I, I like the idea of look at how to allocate this responsibly where there's a big portion of your portfolio that isn't all tied to high risk NFTs that if there's a big price fluctuation or something happening in the market, you're completely illiquid. Like that's a difficult mm -hmm. part of NFTs in general is there, it's only worth something as long as there's a buyer, uh, which is yeah. very different. You know, when, when Bitcoin, ETH, like just other things are, are rallying, you see a shift of, you know, because people need liquidity to go play in another market. And so, yeah, it's just really be smart that, you know, you can get out with a, a portion of your, a portion of your portfolio and that you're not all in high risk know things or as you've made those gains lock them in you know keep a portion of your portfolio not necessarily exposed to highly volatile industries that's all that, that's all i can say depending again on your stage if you're in growth 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 right now and you're okay to lose it great you know and that's totally fine so yeah just i, I love that kind of as advice like really think of yourself as an investor here and this is truly a portfolio and so be smart about it 100%. Um, yeah and question i mean 
we we had the bear market. Uh, we we launched our planet in the bear market in that kind of June July time frame, um, which a lot of people said we were nuts, but we did it. And uh, you know, the culture shifts here so quickly in Web three on what's meta. I don't even want to say meta of the week. That feels way too short term, but it does change and it does fluctuate. You know, I'm curious on your thoughts on any changes or improvements to the trading culture that we currently have to where we kind of think it should evolve and, and move forward to. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. A lot of people say is the next bull or ask is the next bull run going to be the same as the last one? And I think it's going to be we're definitely going to need another bull run, but I think it's going to be very different to the previous one. I and agree. I don't know what it's going to look like. Yeah. Uh, but it will be very different. And I think where the, the, the wild levels of speculation that we've seen are going to diminish as time goes on. And that tends to happen as markets get more efficient and more people enter the space and they mature, uh, you know, the, the speculative nature tends to get lower and the, the sort of like the profitability as a percentage gets lower. But uh, it also means that the downside is also capped where they'll hopefully, and, and I'm very confident there'll be far fewer sort of rug pulls and far fewer projects getting away with minting out and then disappearing with a million, $2 million as, as we saw all over the time last year. So uh, I'm, I'm sort of hopeful for the space. And I think that the market is going to mature and then people will probably be hopefully buying and thinking with a, a bit of a longer term time horizon and doing more research into the products they buy and um, the things that they buy and, and have a better understanding of why they're buying what they're buying. And uh, I, I think that a lot of the value will accrue to like a smaller pool of NFTs versus where we saw like so many possible connections going crazy, mm. collections going crazy. I think the cream will like rise to the top and uh, what, what, what that makeup is, is still very much TBD. Like the space is very, very new. You know, really it's only been a significant space for about 18 months, maybe two years, uh, you know, go back four or five years ago and the first NFTs were coming out, but very few people cared about them. And now uh, it's been about 18 months of like a larger, like thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people at, at its peak sort of in the space. And when we get to millions and tens of millions and hundreds of millions, it'll once again look very, very different. And the projects that survive and that are sort of significant today and can make a name for themselves or build a community that is sort of passionate and, and you know sticks around, uh, they will be the ones I think that will be extraordinarily successful in the future. Uh, and of course, the art that is created today that is, uh, you know, re like uh, respected, revered, in, you know, by artists that are well known or established or prolific, uh, I think art is going to age incredibly well. One of the things about art is that there's no roadmap, there's no team really. It, it is what it is. You, you, you get what you pay for. And, uh, you know, you, Art can't really be robbed is one of the most beautiful things where it's like, especially if it's on-chain art and it's like you have it forever. And then there's always a the potential that uh, another project, some sort of catastrophe happens, even like really legitimate projects. Like there are, there, you know, no project is immune, uh, whereas art kind of is in a certain extent. So I, I think art will age incredibly well. Yeah, uh, it's, um, I remember commentary even at NFT NYC when I think reality was setting in for a lot of us, right? And deeply empathetic to how many of us lost money, right? You you were kind of making long-term bets on your life. You know, a lot of us were shifting careers, like this is a place to be, it's only going to go up forever, you know? And I think reality set and uh, a lot of people were calling back for the heyday that was, you know, expected to return in no time. And I I think you're right. I don't think it's going to be the same kind of a bounce back to that magnitude, but it's kind of a necessary evil or a course correction that needs to happen that will be a little bit more steady. Um, mm. People will see, still see gains, but they're not rushing here just because they think this is a gold rush, you know, that everyone's out here making hundreds of thousands of dollars and I'm missing out and that's the only reason they're here. I think they'll see it as more legitimate. I think they'll see this as a rising asset class, you know, which is a force to be reckoned with. I think it will be on the map for so many other reasons because it did need to flush out, you know, a lot of the, the, the noise there was, I think at one point, I think there was something like six NFT projects being launched a day and in the so there was, there was something insane and rising tides float all boats, right? You didn't have to do very much at that time to be somewhat successful. You could kind of throw a dart 
And I think the best part now is, you know, this community has put me through the ringer, you know, on due diligence and questions and hard questions. And it's something that actually makes me really happy as an NFT enthusiast in the space that people are being tougher, you know, on projects now, um, but, you know, before they make that bet. And I think that that's a, a step that's necessary. I like the higher bar, um, quite mm -hmm. frankly, on who they're, you know, going to allow to be successful going forward is you, you need to clear some, I think, tough hurdles now which is great. So I, it's a culture I, I want to support and hope to support. Um, yeah. Zen, do you, uh, this is a big part of your 30 days for NFT program and a lot of like your onboarding. I know that's one of your kind of specialties. So can a best advice for new people entering the space, spending their hard earned money, you know, how to kind of navigate when you first get here. I know this is a, one of the big core tenets to your program. So would love just, how are you thinking about that and what can we do as advocates for web three on kind of bringing in this next wave, you know, of investors, cause we do need it. Yeah. I think about this a lot. And I think that, I mean, there's a, few, I wrote a news, my most recent newsletter was on the topic of onboarding billions and how we really need to think about that. And there's some large scale things we can and need to do like infrastructure improvements, but you know, the vast majority of people, myself included, can't really do that. I'm not a developer. I'm not a designer. I can't help build better platforms or tools. Uh, but what anyone can do is sort of change their mentality, tone, and, and just their approach when they're talking about NFTs to other people, especially if they're curious or interested or wanting to learn more or, or how, how we get them in, involved and excited about the space. And I think the biggest shift is probably removing the financial element and the speculative nature from it. Because while it, it was very exciting to many of us and like we were attracted to the space because we liked the idea of making money, of getting rich quick of finding financial freedom of all of these things. And while many people, of course, also want to make money and get rich, most people are risk averse and the space is insanely risky. So as soon as you start talking about, um, you know, the speculative nature and, and the ability to make so much money quick, you know, red flags start going up for people and, and they go, well, hang on, if that's possible, then surely it must also be a big chance of going to zero. And then, then they're like, yeah, I'm not really that interested in, in gambling and speculating on, on these things. I don't really get it. I don't really want to, you know, take a bunch of my money or even some of my money or some of my time and, and try to understand this space. But I think if instead we frame it um, differently and talk about like the, the technology or the use cases and the ways that, you know, you can expand your business and, and find new clients or customers, or that you can, you know, build communities in more meaningful ways, or that, uh, you know, uh, DAOs are a great example where you, you could have like an organization, a business, whatever it is, but it's global and it's transparent and it's autonomous and it's decentralized. And there's so many cool and interesting things there. I think that is when people can get excited by the technology rather than the speculative nature. And I think that is really the sort of the, mind frame that we should be using when we are talking to sort of quote unquote the the mainstream audience the rest of the world the people who aren't already in the space because you know nfts were everywhere last year you couldn't turn on a, like a late night talk show without seeing them either being laughed at or you know celebrated for whatever reason and uh it was all over tw uh obviously twitter and and uh discord the social media platforms but there was a long time when it was also all over youtube and Instagram and TikTok, and so it's not like people haven't had the chance that like people know about it now like most people like if we go back a year ago most people hadn't heard of nfts or 18 months ago now most people have and they've they're just actively deciding you know this is not something i want to spend a lot of time figuring out understanding it's not for me uh and i think that that's because they think it's something that it's not and i think that's the perception that we need to work on changing and it's really a, a thing that everyone can take like can and should play their, their role in, and it's about um, a mentality shift above, above all. Yeah, well, and it's it's intimidating, right? Um, just anytime you're from onboarding is its own challenges, mm. and I love some of the tech that they're trying to figure that out, you know, right? Where, um, yeah, I know some people complain, don't love it, but even using tools like CrossMint and others for just credit card purchasing, you know, and trying to mm -hmm. avoid um, creating your own wallets, vaults, and using custody accounts. I mean, it's just, it's a reality that you have to reduce friction points. It's Bloomberg put out something that as soon as it's above three friction point asks, people lose mm. interest. It's like by 30%, every time you ask them to do another step, people are like, oh, forget it. You know, this isn't yeah. worth your time. Even if, so it's a level of commitment to even get started, let alone continue and then try to navigate the space and make a call. 
you know, on how to learn and then the tools, the resources, all of these things. So I you know, love what you say. I just, it's kind of us advocating in a better way. I think mainstream media has done us a big disservice and really shit on NFTs as a narrative and just made it only analogous to art collectibles mm. um, and that it feels silly. And I think they're, they're missing a lot of tech components and a lot of community spirit where it it's, again, it's unignorable as to why Starbucks is here. It's unignorable as to why Walmart mm -hmm. is here. And it's because, you know, so much power is in small communities when they are this sticky and this, you know, connected on the daily and the regular. And there are major brands and corporations that would pay and kill for that access. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know, there, there's just, there's power with us if we could kind of, you know, unite and figure it out. And I think that we're in the process of doing that. Um, question from uh, Eternal Phoenix. Uh, what do you think about the idea that NFTs will only really be adopted when people don't know they're using them? Starbucks is a good example of that. Yeah, I think that's true to an extent. So I think that one of the, the, the biggest ways we're going to go quote unquote mainstream is by abstracting away the technology and having people interact with them without knowing that they're interacting with them. Reddit is also a good example where they called these digital collectibles, digital avatars, people could pay with a credit card. They didn't have to use a wallet or anything like that. And uh, they, they are NFTs. They're sort of minted on the Polygon blockchain and they can have them in their wallet and interact with them that way if they want. But uh, at the surface level, most people didn't realize that they were NFTs. And I think that that is the best and easiest way that we're going to get millions and billions of people um, using the technology. That said, I don't think that that is properly onboarding people to Web3 blockchain technology and NFTs. That's, that's getting people wrapping their heads around the idea of owning digital assets. And that is like a huge part of it. Uh, so it, it's important stuff that we need to sort of, it's awesome to see. And, and I think that what Reddit did and what Starbucks is saying that they're going to do is, is really great for the space. But I think that's like, that gets people to sort of like this web 2.5 place. And then to get from there to from there to web three, it's like, that's when we have to communicate, educate and teach people about um, self custody and the asset, having a wallet that you actually have full ownership of that no third party, no bank or government or company can sort of get rid of it and, and take it from you, seize it from you or control it and say, you can't do this, that or the other. It's in your wallet and you own a hundred percent of it. And I think that is the most powerful thing of NFTs and the whole, that's the whole reason crypto even exists in the first place. And uh, I think that gets lost sometimes. And I think that uh, it, it's, it's like a two-step onboarding process, at least two steps, but one is getting people, you know, like Reddit did millions of people, millions of wallets rather. And, and, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of individuals that now have these assets, but um, take getting from there to actually understanding what owning a digital asset on a blockchain means and what that feels like. That's, that's where the learning curve is still very steep. And it's, it really is going to remain steep because it's a, it's a complicated topic and it's different to the worldview that most people have had for a very long time. Uh, it's honestly, it's probably going to be a generational thing where it's going to take a few decades before like the majority of the world, truly understands and, and like self custodies their assets. So we're gonna, we're gonna be in the web 2.5 era for a very long time, but that's fine mm -hmm. and, uh, and we'll get there. Oh, I, I hear you. I think we've represented ourselves as a web 2.5 brand. Um, I think kind of from the beginning, you know, a lot of that is also done intentionally. Um, just knowing, you know, one of our goals is always as part of the onboarding and connections, a wave of groups, they need to connect with things that are moving beyond what's already here and there's just too much debate on metaverse and what the hell is that you know and for just any average individual to ever pick up on that it's just it's too difficult i remember during covid uh just as an illustrative example sometimes catastrophic events or just big market momentum sometimes change everything when covid hit they saw a rise of digital banking and mobile apps like well simple um revolute all of those things um, increase about eight times the pace that they were expecting. And it was for obvious reasons, right? No one can go to their bank. They can't travel the branches mm. anymore. Everyone was landlocked. And so you saw our, our parents, our grandparents, who probably at one point in time never wanted to take a picture of their check and accept that that was actually going to get deposited. Now they trust it, right? And so it's kind of mm. taking that leap of faith that this can be something that can be trusted and used and is user-friendly and accessible and so, yeah, I, I love the momentum it's starting to take. And I think 
you have a couple of these groups adding more crypto portfolios, they're big financial institutions, bigger players and innovative players like Reddit and Starbucks. So I think more people will figure this out because it will feel like loyalty and reward programs. I think so many people in the world are aware of air miles. You know, oh, cool, I can take mm-hmm. points and I can get something. They know membership access. That's my analogy I always try to use with my friends. I'm like, you you guys, you want access to a country club? What if that was just on your phone and you just showed that yeah. for life and no one could take that from you um, and you could sell that? Uh, I'm like, that. that's it. That's what it is. And so it's like finding analogous examples that are feel real world that I think make people a little bit more comfortable with what they own. But yeah, maybe it is generational. I'm hoping it's a decade. I'm calling for it to happen a little bit faster, but I think there's going to be some extenuating circumstances to force us um, to all want that a little bit more. Maybe that's regulation. I don't know. Something will happen. I, I'm hoping that makes this easier. Um, next question. I don't, I don't want to put you on the spot for any things, uh, but just shifting, you know, our thinking um, around, you know, approaching things like free meta and paid projects. And I think just having some flexibility you know, around what project founders are doing. I know when we launched, there was kind of, no, that's not the way things are done. And I think we just have to accept that there's projects that want to do a different style of offering and that there's no one way to do things. And so just would love your thoughts, not saying free is bad, paid is good, just nothing, you know, along those likes, but just broadening our view, you know, on just when a project's coming out, they're doing something for a reason, um, even though it might not be in vogue that week. Yeah, I think that's the thing, like, every project is going to do things that's that is right for them and for some projects a free mint makes total sense and for others it makes zero sense and we went through this whole free mint meta for a while and then the market started to sort of expect every project to be a free mint and then it seemed by comparison a, a 0.05 mint was expensive and 0.1 was very expensive and you know at the start of this year projects with dutch auctioning and minting out at one ETH, two and a half ETH. 0.5 ETH, you know, a standard mint of 0.2 was like applauded as being cheap. And, you know, we go through market cycles and things change and adjust. Uh, and I think that it's good to go through the cycles and see what works. And we're all experimenting here and, and trying things out. And ultimately it's, you know, each project will have their own reason for doing what they're doing. And, you know, if you need capital because you're trying to build a company or a business or a brand or a something else, then you generally need to do a paid mint or, uh, I mean, the other option was relying on royalties, but that is seemingly going to zero. Uh, and I mean, there are other ways you get VC funds, you, uh, you reserve a large supply of the token that you sell in the future, you do some hybrid models. And I think it really just depends on what you're trying to do. And, and the other thing is a lot of people probably don't think about this as much, but it's the idea that people value free things way less. So if you're trying to build like a premium product or brand, then you are better off trying to mint at a higher price and living up to that expectation because at a free mint, people might just like a lot of people mint things for free and then immediately flip it for 0.01. But maybe you've put months and months of work into it. You've worked with an artist, you've built out all this stuff and it's deserving of a 0.05 or 0.1 or 0.3 or whatever mint price. And uh, I think it's then the job of the project to sort of show the market and, and, and you know, through marketing and, and uh, other ways be like, yeah, look, we've done all this work. We think it's worth this much. And if they do a good job, then, then the market will agree and, and mint it out and, and then see what happens after that. Uh, an analogy I always, well, I've st- recently started going back to, I heard it on a podcast uh, a couple months back is sushi. And it's like, if you tell someone, uh, you know, cheap sushi, everyone just like shirks. No one wants to go and buy sushi that costs 75 cents you you get this impression of oh that that can't be good if it's 75 cents Red then flag. you go six, six dollar sushi flag. okay I'll, yeah that must be some good sushi and that's it's not exactly a good parallel because it's you know, sushi is fresh or, or or unfresh but when it comes to the perception of prices and how people value them uh, there's certainly some psychology to higher price things are valued more and then because of how speculated this entire market is and intangible it is, things that are valued more actually might be actually valued more by a self-fulfilling prophecy. So anyway, that was a long way of me saying that, you know, free is fine, paid is fine, Dutch auctions are fine. It just depends on the project and each project needs to decide for themselves what, what makes sense. Yeah, and I, I, I think the, my biggest takeaway, because, you know, we, we had a lot of people um, 
just advice. It's free advice. It's, you know, and it always we're listening and kind of just, you know, resonate with what the, the, the group was saying, but it, free was not going to work for us. We, this was a project, um, not a project. This we're trying to build a business and, you know, it's just the, the tone that I always wanted to shift is just because it feels like it's the rule of thumb right now. It's not really a rule. Mm -hmm. These things are too new and it's only until the next player changes it and has some success with it that you see it you saw it with proof you see it with others like as soon as they put a stake in the ground it shifts and so you know not to get so married to i think one way that something is done and keep minds open and i think some of the best ideas come from the system where we're getting a bunch even from our community so like there's no one way to do something just because it's been done um and that this is the way to have a success like there's no formula now it's only been 18 months um uh, lots of different ways to do something so I love that. And the creator royalties, I mean, I could do a whole other session hmm. on that one. Um, I think that's angering a lot of people or concerning a lot of people and could dissuade, you know, many projects from, you know, trying to figure this out or, you know, say goodbye to free, med uh, free mint then because uh, people need to get, figure out a way to fund their projects somehow. So you'll see higher prices. So I'm, I'm interested to see how that shakes out. Um, not, not loving that conversation, but we could save that for another time. Um, just reminding everyone in event chat, if you do have questions for Zen, uh, Zeneca, please ask there. Now is the time as we're kind of nearing the top of the hour. So I just want to make sure everyone's getting what they, they need and hope out of this. Um, anything else, Zeneca, that you want to tell us about your 30 days uh, of NFTs program? Um, things I know we're going to make the links available for everyone here. And we have a couple of master classes. I know with your, your program that we want to raffle off to a few. I'll, I'll get to that exercise here in a second. But yeah, tell, tell us about what they can expect um, once they enter in the uh, the portal. Yeah, I mean, so the 30 years of NFTs is probably the thing I'm most proud of that we've done in the year that we've started Zen Academy. And it's an idea that one of our team members, uh, head of marketing, Emily, came up with, uh, head of marketing community, uh, two, three, three months ago, I think. And she basically had the idea of this uh, educational course done via email, because up until now, everything we've done has either been a newsletter, a, a, a YouTube video, a Twitter thing, a Discord thing, or like some structured course by some online portal. And um, going back to the whole friction topic you were talking about before, all of those things add a little bit of friction. Like some people don't use Twitter. Some people, you know, don't watch content on, on YouTube. Some people, if you have your online portal like Nas Academy, that uh, is great, but then you have to go sign up an account and all that kind of stuff. Whereas basically everyone has an email address and that is the big unlock where we were like well maybe we can instead of asking people to come to our platform we can go to them and we can educate them where they are and the beauty of it is is that um it's perfect for beginners because again a lot of beginners don't have a twitter account don't use discord and aren't on these platforms uh so the way it works is anyone can go to 30 days of nfts.com enter the email address and then every day for the next 30 days they'll receive an email with a sort of three to five minute uh, read and it'll be really basic and simple and explain in, in easy to understand terms what is an nft what is a blockchain uh you know where do we go from here and, and then like, what is discord and what is a wallet and how do you set up a wallet and what's a hardware wallet and a, a cold wallet versus a, a hot wallet and uh, all of these things and terms and phrases what is alpha what is gm what is wag me and uh you know all of this stuff, there's such a large learning curve. It's, te it's taught in like this drip feed way where it's not overwhelming. So uh, I say it's like the course you can send to your parents or your, your siblings or your um, relatives or friends, people who are not into NFTs, but they, they know about them, they're curious, they don't know it in. Maybe they want to know what you're up to with all your time and you just send them to 30daysofnfts.com and they enter their email and then bam, they're they're taking in the course effectively and, and just reading an email like with their morning coffee or you know for three minutes waiting for the, the bus or the train or whatever it might be. And uh, yeah, the reception has been really, 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 we're really thrilled about that. So I think this is gonna be, yeah, something that we continue to really um, work on and improve. And yeah, it's, it's, it's doing a great job of onboarding people already. I love that. Yeah, I think it's all about digestibility. I don't know if mm. even that's a word, guys. I don't know that. <laughs> it is. Uh, we'll make it a word. <laughs> digestibility. Uh, well, and you're right. I mean, Discord is the bane of my existence. I've done mm. it ever since I got into NFTs. It is just, it's not my thing, but I, I learn it and my team laughs at me constantly because I'm doing it wrong. Um, and uh, 
you know, just to be able to meet people where they're at as far as like absorbing information and making it digestible and putting it in different places where then it could be passed on and shared. It's mm -hmm. really difficult to try and demonstrate this to a friend. I'm like, look at what you could experience over here. It's like inviting them to a part they don't want to go to, right? And it's like mm -hmm. dragging them there and it can feel so overwhelming and they don't know what they're doing. So it's kind of, no, let me just take you some, you know, snippets of just what you can learn and just see how much flipping fun this is, right? Like it's actually so fun once you're in it and you know what you're doing. Um, so yeah, I, I love that. One question here. I mean, uh, we did a partnership with the floor team um, mm -hmm. for their floor app. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that tech. If you are, I am. I invested in them actually. Uh, big fans of them. Perfect. So yeah, the question, uh, we, we, we launched that just last week, had a really solid reception um to to you know folks downloading it and experiencing it even in its beta stage so just saying it sees it as a game changer just curious on your thoughts of it um this is from yeti 77. yeah a big fan of it i think it's it's a really i mean they're, they're solving a problem that a lot of people had and that's like when with regular you can like, really sort of check your portfolio and the price of things and that doesn't hasn't quite existed for nfts and uh, it actually this <laughs> goes back to like my first early days of uh, the space where I used to post these Google spreadsheets on Twitter with the floor price of all of these collections because uh, you couldn't find it anywhere. OpenSea didn't even have the floor price. It, it was very laborious to get together. And then uh, after a while, people started coming up with websites and they were terrible at first and they were glitchy and bugged and eventually they got better. And now you can find floor price everywhere. OpenSea introduced it, but still hasn't been great for mobile. And I think floor is just this perfect way to check the floor <laughs> of projects yeah. and check your portfolio mm -hmm. and the U it's so clean like the ui ux is they really nailed that which i think is is one of the big things that the space has been lacking up until honestly i mean we're still lacking now but uh so much of crypto has been built by um, engineers and developers and designers uh, and user journey experience people come in way later in the process so uh yeah th they really nailed that as well so big fan of Floor, floor, obviously, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I am as well and got to know their team quite well over the last few months. And I think a big part of that too is with Christine, just like with her Robin Hood experience. Like I think she knows user journeys and experiences and things, right? And knows what works, you know, to validate information. So I've, I think they've done a fabulous job in holding more pops like this. I think we need more easy play tools. All right. Well, we are at the top, uh, Zeneca. So grateful for your time. I don't see any other immediate and pressing questions. And so just any kind of closing thoughts as we're wrapping up, you know, this is event three in our learn good shit, uh, you know, conversations, just anything else that you'd love, you know, this group that our planet to know, take away with. Um, uh, yep. Floor is yours. And then we'll wrap up. Yeah, I mean, just appreciate you having me. It's, I mean, I appreciate everyone, you know, tuning in and turning up today. It's uh, education is so important. And I think that especially in this space where there's so much to learn, it's, like this is a bear market and this is a time to sort of be investing in yourself and trying to like learn ideas and and topics. And uh, I'm, yeah, such a big fan of this this week that you're you're running and and the idea behind it. And uh, yeah, just for everyone out there is. Uh, yeah, just keep just keep on tuning into things like this and you know bettering yourself and uh good things will happen so yeah thank you all awesome well, always great to have you and i'm sure we'll see more of you can you do me a favor though is that we're gonna raffle off a couple we're, we're number one we're gonna make 30 days for nfts available for everyone, even if it feels uh whether you're a beginner you've been here for all two years and you're helping teach others and get ready there's something helpful or reuse this um, to pass on to somebody else, right? And just kind of echo and amplify what Web3 is all about. And, you know, that there's tools like this to help people feel comfortable. Um, so, so we will make that available. Can you pick three numbers between one and 74 for me? I will be discounting some of my own team members. So no one in this audience can start quickly seeing if their number X, Y, Z, but just give me three random numbers between one and 74 uh three well a random hey <laughs> i'm still gonna go ah, three, you love three, three okay 333 and 66. 66 okay locked in no one can do anything <laughs> perfect um all right thank you so much um 
Yeah, Zeneca is a holder. Just if anyone didn't know, he is one of the advisors of our planet and, and a holder, which we so appreciate. So lots of ways to, to see some overlap here. Um, all right, everybody, the POAP for this event uh, is plural, all lowercase, all one word. I'm tagging it right now um, in our event chat. Um, it's open for the next 45 minutes, 30 days of NFTs. That is the name of Zen's uh, program. Um, so there you go. We will be making this recording available. I know we have a global audience, so we have links to this PO app that will be available later. But uh, quit giving everybody all of the hints. I want to make sure they actually listen to the recordings and learn something. Um, I see some people uh, handing these passwords out. So um, again, thank you everyone for joining. Um, we've got some more events coming up this week. We've got a couple of the team behind Probably Nothing tomorrow, CK and Bunglo. That's going to be on Twitter space. We have Somi with InPeak on Thursday. Um, and then we've got Ralph uh, from Daily Ralpha um, joining us on Friday and a couple of other you know things like sprinkled in. So hope you're enjoying it. Please leave us feedback and we'll be doing a survey at the end of the week to see what you enjoyed, liked, disliked, so that we can put together some additional programs right now. So um, thank you all for joining. I will give you your time back. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.